Reed, I appreciate that. Well, I like those old songs. I was thinking while they were playing that offertory, just how important music is. And, uh, you know, music uh, elicits emotion. And so we need to be careful with our music. You need to be careful what you listen to and definitely what's played in church. And uh, as Miss Susan was playing, the girls were playing over in the orchestra. Uh, I thought, you know, that that's really what church to me should be, a celebration. And uh, it, the music ought to reflect that. Sometimes, uh, you know, we'll sing uh, Sweet Hour of Prayer and it turns into Sweet 14 Hours of Singing. And uh, now I believe in reverence. I think there's certain songs that ought to be more reverential. But uh, I think when we sing, we should sing with the mindset of worship. Yes, and there are certain songs that should be celebratory. Right. And as they were playing that, it, it made me think of that, just how we are on the winning side. We are victorious. Yes. And uh, that's, how we ought to, that's how we ought to sing. Right? That's how we ought to play our instruments. That's how we ought to live our life, that we have victory in Jesus. And sometimes we act like we don't, right? right. And so, uh, you know, as Christians, this world is going through much of the same things that we are in our daily lives. And they're, they're wanting uh, to see somebody that has some victory. Right. And, uh, you know, sometimes we don't act like we've got a lot of victory. I mean, she just sang about the Statue of Liberty and the cross and how one is for the freedom of citizens, the other is for the freedom of the soul. And uh, no matter what this world throws at us, if you're a born-again Christian, you know Jesus Christ, your Savior, this is the worst you're ever going to have it. But if you're not, this is the best you ever have it. And so uh, we've been preaching the last few weeks about sharing our faith and how you and I as Christians should share our faith and the responsibility of it. And uh, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1 tonight, Acts chapter number 1. We're going to finish that up this evening. And uh, the thing that we have to realize is this is God's plan. And uh, I'm thankful God has a plan. He didn't leave it up to us because I know this, everything that man has ever touched, we've messed up. Garden was real nice till we got a hold of it. The Word of God's real nice till we start messing with it. Church is a great place till you put people in it, right? And uh, marriage is perfect until you take two sinners and put them together and tell them to serve uh, each serve God and serve each other together. And all of a sudden, we'll mess that up too, won't we? And so, I believe God. You know, John three sixteen. We know this is maybe the greatest verse in the Bible. For God so loved the well, if he loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, surely he would not put that verse in the Bible if he didn't want the whole world to be saved. Right. Now, I know this, and you know this, the whole world's not going to be saved. Matter of fact, everybody in the Bible belt's not going to be saved. Right. But I do believe that if God wants the whole world to be saved, he's got a plan for the whole world to be saved. Good. Now whether or not people will accept the free gift of salvation is not the point. The point is that God wants the world to be saved and he had a plan for it. And he left it to the church to carry that plan out. And so we're not responsible for people to be saved or not. That's up to the Holy Spirit of God. What we're responsible for is to carry out the plan that God left us. And we find that in Acts chapter 1 as we've studied uh, through the Gospels, the Great Commission. He leaves. Think about this. Now Jesus has been crucified in John 21. Uh, we know that, uh, that uh, the, the disciples there had gone fishing. We looked last week about Jesus telling me he's going to make them fishers of men. Now they're, they're just fishing. Right. And they ain't fishing for men. They're just fishing. Right. And so... He says in verse 19 of John 21, he says, follow me. And I, I, I'm so interested in Peter because, let's be honest, most independent Baptists we know, including us, are like Peter. Right. So Peter turns to Jesus and 
The Bible said, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? And Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? <laughs> he, looks, he looks at John, he says, okay, because the Lord told him, he said, feed my, feed my sheep. He told him three times to do that. And so Peter thought, well, you know, he left this for me to do. I'm, I'm going to take all the heat off of me, and I'm going to look over at John, the one Jesus loves. He said, what, what about him? What, what, do you, what do you want him to do? Why is it all on me? So Jesus said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? That's right. Amen. I just want him to sit right there till I come back. Why do you care? What's it to you? So we look, and a lot of times we're looking at everybody else. Well, why is it that I have to do this? And why, why is it that God wants me to share the gospel? And why, why is it that I have to run a bus route? And why is it that I have to knock on doors when my old brother so-and-so won't do it? Well, if you don't learn to get your eyes off of people and just get them on God and say, listen, it's not, doesn't, matter, doesn't matter what God has for him to do. What, has, what, what do I have to do? And so he leaves the, in Acts chapter 1. These disciples have gathered again. And... Uh, Bible said uh, in verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? So they come together and they knew the promises of God and said, okay, God, that Jesus, now is, are you going to restore the kingdom? Is now the time, right? You didn't do it before you were crucified, and that's when we thought you'd do it. And, and then we go in the upper room and you share some other things with us. Now is it now the time uh, that you're going to do it? And uh, Jesus said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put into his own power. So he said, you don't, you don't need to know all that. You don't need to worry about when the kingdom is going to be set up. Well, if it's true for them, then it's true for us today. See, some of you are so caught up in Israel and you know Hamas and Iran and Prophecy preacher, why don't you have a Bible prophecy conference? Well, here's my question: If we have a Bible prophecy conference revival, whatever you want to call it, is it going to spur you to do any more for Christ? Because if not, what's the point in having it? Well, I want to know who the Antichrist is. I want to know that why. See, we're not here to to know the times or the seasons. Matter of fact, we don't even need to get caught up in it, because here in verse seven. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the season which the Father hath put in his own power. But, verse 8, here's what he said. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. Amen. So now he's... Verse 9, when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud receiving, received him out of their sight. Right. So let's, let's look at the scene. They're gone, they gone fishing. They're meeting with Jesus and they're saying, okay, now are you going to restore the kingdom now? He said, you don't need to worry about that. I'm going to leave you something to do in verse number 8. He said, I'm going to give you the power to do it. Then verse 9 you, I mean, think about this. Would it not spur you just a little bit to follow God if you saw him taken up in a cloud? I mean, I don't, I, Brother Matt, I guess, I, you know, I, and I understand this, we have the completed word of God, so we should, we should do it because God's word said to. And I guess in, in my flesh, I'm wondering how in the world can you see Jesus crucified, risen from the dead on the third day, walk through a wall and be in the upper room with you. Now you're, now you're, he, he tells you to go out and preach the gospel and, and the Bible said he's taken up in a cloud right. and they're, they're still not getting it. And then 2,000 years later, we've got the completed word of God and we say we believe God's word that's 100% accurate, 100% true and, and that if we're going to, Please God, if we love him, we keep his commandments. And now he says in verse 8 that we uh, will receive power and that we are to be witnesses. It didn't say you might be or could be. It says you shall be. 
So here's God's plan for the whole world. Whatever the Lord requires, the Lord always provides. The Lord required a perfect sacrifice. He provided the perfect sacrifice, right? He's requiring this band of disciples to proclaim the gospel to the whole world. And he's saying, this is the mission and I'm going to prepare you for the mission, but I'm going to give you everything that you need for the mission. And so God so loved the world, we know that's the greatest verse in the Bible. And if God wants the whole world to hear, then he has a plan to do it. We are the instruments to get it done. See, I don't think God's as interested in, in, in our church services. Now, I know, Brother Matt, this is a place for us to come together and worship right together and, and it should be a place of prayer and it should be a place of preaching it should be a place of praising but out there is a place of propagating the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and this is more of encouraging us to go out and do the work of God out there and so if we're not going to go out and do the work there may I say this that the church services we'll have in heaven are a thousand million trillion times better than what we're going to experience here on earth. So if it's just all about getting saved, come to church a few times a week, why wouldn't he just take us on to heaven? Because we're here for a reason. So before he ascended to heaven, Jesus left his disciples a great task to accomplish. It is huge. I mean, think about the whole world. What is it, six, seven, eight billion people on earth now? And God's saying, I want all of them to hear the gospel. Amen. And it was true then, it's true now, Amen. see. And so he gave them the plan to do it. He doesn't ask to come up with their own plan. Listen, I'm glad that someone came up with the Romans road, right? That you've got your soul winner's New Testament and you've marked the Romans road and you go from this verse. That's great because it's the word of God. But understand in Acts chapter 1, they didn't have the Romans road. They didn't have a soul winner training. They didn't have, a, you know, my, my prospect book to carry with them. They had the, the word of God, the promise of God, and the power of God to, uh, to accomplish the plan of God. So maybe we, we're overthinking this thing to the degree that we stop relying on the power of God and we just need to, let's find out, Right? So notice in this scripture quickly, I'll share with you three things I want you to see. First of all, the promise. Now, now the Bible said in verse 8, but ye shall receive power. Now, how many believe that's true? He didn't say maybe might. If He said ye shall. So that tells me that is the promise of God. Shall. Brother Harley, it's, it's dependent on him, right? So the promise is this. Ye shall. Well, that's a personal promise. In other words, he's, he's pointing to those disciples and he's pointing to us today and say, Ye, Shane Hatcher, Matt G, Matt Black. Each one of us, he's pointing and saying, Ye, ye, ye. Why? Because we've got the Holy Spirit of God on the inside. So it's not, it's not confined to these 12 or so disciples. It's not even confined to the hundred and some in the upper room. He's pointing us today and said the same power he's going to give them is the same power that you and I have today. So it's a personal promise that he gives to us when he says the word ye. And this power is available to every single person that will do it. Well, I'm not a preacher. You really are. Because the word preach means to proclaim. You may not stand behind a pulpit. You may not have a congregation, but you are a preacher in the sense that the word preach means to proclaim. And we are all to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. So God is not limited in his ability to get done what he wants done. He just needs labors. I don't, I don't care who's in the White House. I don't care what the Mormons are doing. I don't care if the Jehovah's Witnesses go out before us. I, I don't care, you know, uh, uh, the, the peace in the Middle East. Right? It doesn't matter. What I'm saying is what you and I are looking at and trying to dictate the circumstances that will cause people to get saved. And God's just saying, I'll give you a promise. Here's my promise. It's a personal promise that if ye, you, will go and do it, I'll give you the power to do it. Now, what's our excuse now? Well, I, you know, that's talking to the, that's talking to the, the uh, early disciples. Okay, well, what part is to you? 
Well, the epistles. We're not the church at Corinth. We're not the church at Ephesus. We're not the, see what I'm saying? If you're not careful, you'll take every, the word of God and say, well, that ain't, that's not to us. Well, who's it to? He just needs labors. You don't even have to have the perfect plan. You just have to labor. You're not even responsible for the results. We just got to labor. So it's a personal promise, but then it is a providential promise. So, so can we agree tonight that God is sovereign, that he knows all, that his plan is perfect. Now, I'm, not, I'm, not getting off in, I'm not getting off in crazy doctrine. Hang with me. So here in the book of Acts chapter 1, do you think he looked down through time in his divine providence, in, in his all-knowing eye, and looked down and saw Currytown Baptist Church 2,000 years later and saw this service that I'm preaching and knew exactly what I was preaching. You believe that? I do. So it, it, if he didn't think that today, in the last days, perilous times shall come, if he didn't know all that, he wouldn't have put it in his word, first of all, but then he would have said, in this scripture, except when perilous times come. Right? He had to put that in there. If we're exempt in 2023 going into 24 because hard times are in America, then he would have put an exception in verse number 8. Can we agree? So he knew what would be accomplished. He knew what needed to be accomplished, he would give power for every encounter. When you go out and knock on the door and they cuss you out, do you not think God knew that? Right. When you go out on the bus route, uh, Brother Bobby, and, and hand that track out and invite that kid to church, do you not think God knows that? He knows, and he's saying, here's what I want you to do. You're not responsible for the res You're responsible for the labor. Yes, the Holy Spirit would go before and prepare the way. That's my prayer. When we go knock on doors... Holy Spirit, you go out and prepare the way. I can't, I can't save anybody. If I save them, they're going to hell. My job is to give the gospel. Your job is to give the gospel, right? What if they get mad at us? And, and I know, you know what we do, Brother Matt? We talk ourselves out of it. We, we, we have analysis paralysis. Well, I don't want to burn the bridge. Because what, if I burn the bridge with my anger, then what happens down the road? Brother Foy, I used to buy into some of that. But I don't buy into it. Because I th now, I, now I understand you can be some militant and in their face and, and turn them off from the gospel, but a lot of times we're not there. What we do is we just don't want to give them the gospel. Right. Well, here's, here's my question. God prompts you to give someone the gospel and you say, well, now, now that's a touchy subject in my family because it's Thanksgiving and you know you're not supposed to, uh, you're not supposed to talk about politics or religion at Thanksgiving. I'm 100% for that. But we ain't talking about religion. We're talking about Jesus. So are you thinking that between now, you know, Thanksgiving and the, the new year when they've decided they're going to get back in church, can they guarantee you that they won't die? They can guarantee you they will not die. Because here, here's what happened. I was telling the, the men back there, this uh, friend of mine I went to school with, and I said it's interesting because he and I couldn't stand each other in school. We were both going for the same position in football, and he was cocky, and I probably was too, and we just didn't like each other. And somehow down the road, our paths crossed, and we're both born-again Christians, and he and I become very good friends. Well, his brother, who is 54 years old, had cancer and uh, was really sick, and, and I talked to his brother, and he's born again, said, listen, I don't care about the cancer. I know where I'm going. Well, he died the other day. Now, you can't guarantee you're going to make it till Christmas. Your family and friends can't. So what I'm saying is, is it going to be worth them spending eternity in hell so that the turkey leg doesn't taste bad? Right. Amen. See, that the Holy Spirit, if you'll pray and say, now God, if you'll give me the words to, and, and, and he knows the situation. See, the, you ready? the problem is not God, the problem is us. Yeah. If your kid grew up in church or your grandkid or uh, your spouse or your nephew or your uncle and they grew up and they've heard the gospel, 
You, you probably don't have to browbeat them and tell them you ought to be in church. See, we're, the, we're usually the offensive thing that takes place, not the gospel. It's a lot of times how we present it to those got quieter then. You know why we don't want to say amen there? Because we don't want to be guilty. Right? So we'll say, well, you know, I'm, I'm either not going to share it at all or I'm going to share it, I'm going to tell them the truth, the brutal honesty of the truth. No, I thought I read in there truth in love. Hello? See, the, the personal promise, it's a providential promise, but watch this, it's a powerful promise because he says this in verse 8, you shall receive what? Power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So here he didn't say you would muster up the power. He said he would give you the power. You don't, you ready? You don't generate the power. It's given. And if you generate the power, it's a false power. And I've seen it, man. I've seen them share the gospel and it's like, now you don't want to die and go to hell, do you? Well, nobody does. You want to go to heaven, don't you? You, you understand all this scripture, don't you? Well, say this prayer. You can say a prayer and go to hell. See, the prayer doesn't save you. The faith, the faith is what saves you, right? So we got to be real careful that we don't try to do it in our power, that we rely on his power because it is a providential power, but it's this providential promise, but it's a powerful promise. God's saying, listen, I'll do it. You just, you go do the work and I'll do the saving. By the way, you ready for this? Listen up. God doesn't need your help convicting people. The Holy Spirit of God is a whole lot better at it than you are. Amen. You, you're probably going to make people mad when you, when you do the Holy Ghost job for him. If you'll just share the gospel and let God do his work, when they get saved, Brother Matt, you know what? They get good and saved. You don't have to go chasing them every week. Hello? Let me say, when, when they get good and saved, you don't have to go chasing them every week trying to get them to come to church. When you, when you give them a little shallow prayer that really hadn't saved them, right? When there's no power to save and you just gone through the motions so you can get a, a notch in your belt, that, that's when you got to chase them down. I'm not saying somebody that's saved never, never gets away from God. But I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Now, I'm not the Holy Spirit. Please understand. But I, I, it questions my mind when they get saved and then you can't ever find them. Right? So there's a promise. Number two, in this scripture, he said after, but ye shall receive, right? So there's the promise. What will you receive? The power that the Holy Ghost, after the Holy Ghost come upon you, you shall be witnesses. So the power is this. It is supplied power. Now, think about this. Aren't you glad that somewhere there is a plant that generates the electricity that comes in your house. That you, that you don't have to sit on the, in the backyard on some type of bicycle contraption and generate your own electricity. Now I want to say this. I'm not 100% against going, let's go back to the good old days. But there's only so far I want to go back. Right? To me personally, I like electricity. And I like air conditioning. Can I get a hallelujah amen there? Right? You want to go back? You know, I want to go back to them little house on the prairie that you go ahead. But I don't particularly want to get on a wagon that takes you 14 years to get from, you know, here to Winston-Salem. If you do, help yourself go buy you one. I also don't want an electric car. I like stuff that produces exhaust. Don't you? Amen. I like something that's got 
eight cylinders in it. That's America, hallelujah. But I'm glad we don't have to supply our own power when it comes to electricity. But I'm also real glad I don't have to supply my own power when it comes to doing the work of God. I can't do it. Man, I've tried to do it in the flesh, you know, and I'm sure you have as well, and I always fail. So this promised power would be supplied by the Lord. Let me say this. He does all things well. So we don't muster it up. It is given by the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. That's what the Bible said. And so therefore, if it's uh, salvation is of the Lord, it requires the power only he can provide. I can't save anybody. I can't, I don't, you can't. He can. So this power you and I are seeking is not our power. Now we have to provide the labor and the discipline to actually get up and go. But listen, if we're where we need to be and we've prayed up and we're sharing the gospel and we're making it all about Jesus Christ, he, he's going to do the work. And so it's a supplied power, but then it's a supernatural power. You just, you can't explain it. You can't explain how you, you can be in a church service and you can preach on tithing and somebody comes run the altar because they're scared they're going to die and go to hell and say that's the best message on hell they'd ever heard. I mean, that's, that, ain't, that ain't you. That's God, right? You, you can't explain how God can take the most vile sinner who has lived a life of debauchery and lived for the flesh, right? Had no desire to seek God at all. And all of a sudden, God saves them and they become a preacher or they become a Sunday school teacher or, they, or they're faithful to their... You can't explain that, right? You just cannot explain the supernatural power of God. And that's what he's saying. He said he will give the power after the Holy Ghost. Now that's where the power comes in, Right? We're to be filled, Brother Barry, we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Yes. And, and that is, watch this, that's not the same yes, sir. as the Spirit given at, at salvation, right. right? This feeling is control. Yes. When we think about the feeling of the Spirit of God, God's saying you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. The feeling of the Spirit is a control of the Spirit. And it is a continual thing that you have to continue being filled by the Spirit of God. And if you grieve the Spirit of God, then you're not filled with the Spirit of God. You ever thought maybe the reason we're not accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish is because we're grieving the Holy Spirit of God and we don't have the power that He could give to us if we would be submitted to the Spirit of God. Well, I come to church. Oh, great. That's a good start. But you don't pray, and you don't study your Bible, and, and you, you, you've got your little pet sins that you won't get rid of, and, and you're, you can't understand why God's not doing anything with you because you're not submitted to him, surrendered to him, right? That's where the power. These guys, think about these disciples. Man, they had left everything. Remember last week, fishers of men, they left their job, they left their occupation, left, the, left their family. They're following Jesus around for three and a half years and all of a sudden he's dead. Now they're in this upper room going, oh, what are we going to do now? They're going to come after us and then Jesus comes in. Well, they still had to have a measure of faith to, to look, you think about Pentecost. Yes, the most Baptists I know, you know what we do? I'm done with this. Right? Right? I got to go find me a job somewhere, right? How are we going to pay the bills? Well, they weren't worried about paying the bills. They were about pleasing God. So they, here they are, this supernatural power, this supplied power is on. Now they're going to do a great work. I mean, think about what is getting ready to take place. Pentecost. You've got a handful of people that even believe in Jesus Christ. And old big mouth Peter He's getting ready to open his, his pie hole and he's done nothing but every time it seems like he says anything, it's wrong, right? God's going to use him, probably the most unlikely candidate, except for Judas, he's dead now. The un, most unlikely candidate of all the disciples to do a great work for God and he's going to use him to preach Pentecost. I can just see Peter. 
right? I don't, I can't do it. I mean, I have messed everything else up, right? <laughs> I, I met, my walking with God, I messed everything up. I, I think I'm serving God. They, they all may leave you, Lord, but not me. Up before the cock crows three times, you'll deny, you'll deny me three times. He's like, well, right? Now he's like, hey, boys, been a rough few weeks. Let's go, let's go drown some worms. All right, Peter, let's do it, man. Jesus rebukes him, takes it. Hey, what, you going to feed my sheep? You, know, you love me? Oh, you know I do, Jesus, right? You love me? You know I do. Why do you keep asking me that? Go feed my sheep. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What about him? Right? Something happened to him. It's a supernatural act of God. Salvation is a supernatural act of God that takes place in somebody's life. It's not, it's, not, it's not human. See what I'm saying? It's not, it's not natural to, to the flesh. And so God saves and we go tell. That's it. I mean, it's simple. God says, I'll save you. You go tell people. Well, now, you know, I don't, I don't know all the answers. Well, I didn't ever stop some Baptist folk before. Most of them don't know the answer to much anything, but they sure like to talk about it. You don't believe it? You get some Baptists together and ask them something, and don't have to be spiritual. Well, now let me ask you this. What do you think about how to fix this car? The men be like, well, I'll tell you what I do. I take that injector right there, and I do that. It doesn't have injector. Well, what I do is that you don't have to know. You just talk, right? We just like to talk. But all of a sudden it comes talking about Jesus. Well, what if I say the wrong thing? Well, you've never been worried about saying the wrong thing any other time. I've been listen, I've been ba- I've been pastoring Baptist folk for 21 years. I've heard stuff come out of their mouth. I'll go home and tell Ellen, so what in the world was that? So I know, I know we like to talk and we don't mind saying the wrong thing. But then when it comes to sharing the gospel, we get, well, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Well, how God, you don't think God can fix it? So it's a supernatural power. Then it's satisfactory. Here's what he said. I receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Hmm. Tells me it'll be enough. It will be enough to get the job done. Right? Satisfactory. He does all things. He's going to, do you think, let me ask you this. Do you think we talk about tithing? We preach about tithing, giving, stewardship. Do you think God requires you to tithe and to give? you think he's not going to take care of you? Sure he is. Well, well what about the economy? You think, you think the economy's got God shook up? Right? What, what about if they try to, what about, preacher, what about coming down the pike and you can't, sharing the gospel and you can't even talk about Jesus anymore? You didn't think God knew that was coming down the pike? Right. Good. What about all this transgender stuff? You didn't think God knew about that? Right. See, we're, we're the ones who get surprised, not him. And what he tells us to do is good for 2023. It's satisfactory. It will be enough to get the job done. What God requires, God provides. Amen. You can't save anybody, he can. Yes, sir. You can't convict the heart, he can. Yes. Stop trying to convict people into getting saved and just share the gospel with them. Amen. 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 So then, number three is this. Here's the plan. Look what he says. He says, now, I've said this before, you've heard it preached a thousand times by me, missionaries. Look, ye shall be witnesses unto me. What's the next word? Somebody say it. Both. Doesn't say or. Both. If he's saying both, it means these things at the same time. He didn't say Jerusalem or both. Amen. Now, what, 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 what's he say? Both in Jerusalem 
and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Is that in your Bible say? There's the plan. What's that look like? Uh, quickly, here's what it looks like. The neighborhood. It's hypocritical to give to missions if you won't share the gospel with your neighbor. Good. Right? You can give thousands of dollars missions if you want to, but if you won't, if you won't even hand a track to your neighbor, it's hypocritical. Good. Not only the neighborhood, the next town. It's not just enough for my neighborhood in Japan. I got to go with the next town. Yeah. I got North Carolina needs to be saved. Oh, we're in the Bible Belt, preacher. Yeah, we are, but there's a lot. Here's the thing. You got people moving in by the droves. You got places in North Carolina that don't have churches. We got a lot of them around here, right? right. But there's places. Charlotte needs churches. Right. Raleigh needs churches, Right. There are places that need churches. There are rural areas down east need churches. Yes, sir. So our state needs churches. We just don't need them all side by side. Right. Amen. We just, don't, we just don't need them all on Highway 150 in Davidson County. There, there's plenty enough if people in Davidson County, if churches would get busy and start handing out some tracts, we probably don't need another church plant in this county. We just need some churches to do what we're called to do. But there are some places that need some churches in our state. Well, then not only the, the neighborhood, the next town, we need to look at the next state. You know why I'm so burdened about the West? Because there are hundreds of thousands of people and there's 13 churches, independent Baptist churches in Idaho. Right? You, you, you take Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, South North Dakota, you look at that little area and you, you, you've got more churches in this county than you got in those states. Right. Don't believe me? Brother Matt, how many, how many independent Baptist churches are in Kansas? Approximately. 19,000? One per town. Miss Janine, you know Idaho. How many independent Baptist churches do you think there are in Idaho? Not very many. See what I mean? Yes, sir. We're responsible for the United States of America. You go to the Northeast, right? Brother Earl, you spent some time in New York. A lot of churches up there in the northern, in the country part. There we go. See, see what I mean? The reason we're in the mess we're in in this country is because we've not evangelized our own country. We have to evangelize the net neighborhood, the next town, the next state, the nation. Amen. America needs Jesus. We just sang, America, God still loves you. Well, if he loves them, why are we not telling them that? Amen. I mean, talk about California all you want to and how wicked the place is, and it is, but why is it wicked? Well, they've, they've denied God. Well, a lot of them, have, you ever been to California, you realize that, that Los Angeles has about three independent Baptist churches. We've not evangelized our nation, right? We need to evangelize. Good. And then not only the nation, the nations. Amen. We're responsible for the whole world. Yes, sir. Now you can't go. Maybe God doesn't call you to go, right? Yes. But he has called others to go. Yes, sir. And that's why we support missions. That's why we run buses. That's why we have a Spanish ministry. That's why we go to, on mission trips. Amen. It's because it's not just enough to hand out tracts, though we should in our community. It's not just enough to, to go help another church in our state hand out tracts, though we should. We've got to do the and, both and. That's the plan. The question is, for each one of us, what does that look like for us? Right? Well, I know this. I got to share the gospel. Yes, sir. That's my part. Amen. But then as far as missions, that's something I have to pray about, you have to pray about, and say, God, what do you want me to do? Yes, sir. Right? That's how we reach the world with the gospel. Amen. God has a plan. He ha he's given us the power, right? He's given us the promise. 
Now it's up to us just to simply do what God's asked us to do. Our job is the obedience part. Will you and I be obedient? Let's stand together. Bow our heads tonight. No one's looking around. The altar's open. Maybe God spoke to your heart about your personal soul winning, your personal outreach. Maybe he spoke to you about what, you, what he wants you to do even more for missions. You come. You come.